Hello, everyone, and thank you all so much for tuning in to our panel discussion today that will focus on the problem of plastics pollution and the urgent actions we need to take on climate. As we begin a new session in Congress and welcome a new administration, we must shift from talking about this, the defining challenge of our time, to acting and confronting the climate crisis and mitigating its impact on our communities now and for future generations. A year ago, I introduced the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act of 2020 with Senator Tom Udall and Representative Alan Lowenthal. This legislation would take critical steps to address plastic pollution, including phasing out single-use plastic products, holding corporations accountable for wasteful products, reducing wasteful packaging, and reforming our broken waste and recycling collection system. In December, we asked again uh, to urge President Biden to adopt a comprehensive plan to address the ramifications of plastic pollution on Americans' health and our environment, both of which disproportionately impact communities of color, while also creating good jobs by boosting the domestic manufacturing of sustainable alternatives. We know this is not a hypothetical problem. It is an existential crisis that is devastating to communities across the globe. But this also presents us with an opportunity to build a new visionary framework that prioritizes a resilient, clean economy, environmental justice, and public health. The Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act presents a comprehensive solution for one of the leading contributors of carbon dioxide production, plastics. This bill will rein in waste, improve recycling, decrease harmful emissions, and ensure that plastics don't wind up in our oceans and waterways. This legislation would phase out unnecessary single-use plastic products, hold corporations accountable, reduce packaging, and reform our waste and recycling systems. Recent reports estimate that each person consumes a credit card's worth of plastic per week. That's because plastic is everywhere and it doesn't biodegrade. Plastic breaks down into microplastics that are found in the rainwater on the peaks of the mountains in New Hampshire to farmland soil that produces our food and in our lakes, rivers, and seas. Plastic production is also a major contributor to climate change with its production expected to account for 20% of global oil consumption by 2050. Meanwhile, 92% of U.S. plastic waste is never recycled. So by shifting the responsibility for recycling and cleanup to the companies that produce wasteful products, the, waste, the practical waste reduction and waste management policies can reverse this trend and put the United States on a path to break free from plastic pollution. pollution. As we have asked the president to make addressing this issue a priority, not just by supporting our bill, but by implementing strong executive actions right out of the gate. And President Biden has already shown that addressing climate change is a top priority by rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement and implementing a slate of executive orders aimed at tackling the climate crisis. But we know there's more work to be done. And I am excited to be joined by an incredible panel of local experts and advocates on climate and environmental justice. We have State Representative Maria Robinson, Kirsty Pesci from the Conservation Law Foundation, Nancy Downs from Oceana, and Dwayne Tyndall from Alternatives for Community and Environment, and Emily Norton of the Charles River Watershed Association. All of them have joined us today to discuss the, their work and the issue of plastic pollution. 
I'd like to now introduce my friend, State Representative Maria Robinson. Prior to her election to represent Framingham in the State House, she worked in the clean energy sector to address climate change. Her experience ranges from working with the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources to deploy solar panels at municipal waste and wastewater facilities, to working in state legislatures and agencies in over half of the country, advocating for clean air regulations to provide expert testimony in front of Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. She is the only elected member appointed to the US EPA Clean Air Act Advisory Committee, which oversees the technical implement implementation of the Federal Clean Air Act. Representative, thank you for joining us. And can you tell us a bit about the policies that you have been working on at the state level? Absolutely, and thank you so much for having us today, uh, Representative Clark. It, it's such an honor to be here with some incredible experts that I know are working um, with many of my colleagues in the State House and also in state houses across the country. We're so thrilled that you are tackling this and asking the Biden administration to tackle plastics at the federal level. But of course, states continue to lead in many ways, especially over the past four years, on a lot of important issues um, around environmentalism, around clean energy, clean water, clean air. And this is, uh, this is no exception to the rule. Um, when it comes to plastics, in 2020 alone, more than 200 bills were introduced across 35 states um, aimed at reducing plastic pollution in some way, shape, or form. And that included um, bans such as single-use plastic bans or um, polystyrene bans, um, anti-preemption bills, and then, of course, the extended producer responsibility work that you've mentioned. And we have all of those bills um, pending here in Massachusetts as well. Um, what I'm particularly excited about it is that the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, of which I'm on the board and also the Massachusetts representative, um, Earlier this month, they pulled together a, a new network. It's called the EPR for Packaging Network. And it start, started out with a group of legislators from about nine different states announcing a really coordinated effort to start to hold producers responsible um, for that end of life management of plastic packaging. And we're so thrilled that legislators from uh, both sides of the aisle, frankly, are are getting invested in ensuring that plastics are not a long-term part of our future, but we are finding um, unique and creative ways to use them. Um, some of the things that I'm excited about, as well as that, you know, Hawaii actually passed a law last year that has their state department of transportation looking at using recycled plastic uh, for road work. And so it's solving multiple problems in this creative way that would also reduce uh, reduce pollution at the end of the day. So um, of course, you know, we, we see that even New York is looking more comprehensively at things like their Right to Refill Act, um, which it turns out that plastics is not just an environmental issue, but sometimes can be a health code issue in, in that situation. So it would allow you to, in non-COVID times, bring reusable uh, food and drink containers in, into different food establishments. So here in Massachusetts, I know that my colleague, uh, Michael Day, is introducing a, a really amazing um, extended producer responsibility bill. Um, the incredible representative, Michelle Socolo, uh, is working with many of these people on this call uh, on some comprehensive work along with Senator Jason Lewis uh, as they lead uh, the brand new Zero Waste Caucus. And, and so we're thrilled to see uh, some of the work expanding our existing bottle bill um, and, and looking to just reduce the amount of plastic that we have and, and shifting that responsibility, which I think is so important from the consumers to the producers in order to ensure that there, there's real equity there. Um, for many folks, in a, and I'm sure others will, will touch on this, this is an environmental justice issue as much as anything else, recognizing that incinerators and landfills are, are in some of our poorest and most vulnerable communities. So I'm thrilled to be here with everyone today and thank you so much for having us. 
Oh, thank you, Representative, and thank you for your leadership. And I'm glad that everyone you mentioned is part of our incredible NA5 delegation. So thank you all for being such leaders on this issue. And now I'd like to introduce Kirsty Pesci. Kirsty is the director of the Zero Waste Project and a senior fellow at the Conservation Law Foundation. Kirsty is a former Massburg staff attorney, actively engaged in waste reduction and opposing the expansion of landfill and incinerator capacity. Kirsty is part of the Zero Waste Boston Coalition, which advocates for zero waste solutions such as reuse, recycling, redesign, and composting. Uh, anaerobic digestion in the city of Boston. She also founded the Central Massachusetts group Residents for Alternative Trash Solutions to oppose a regional landfill expansion in her community and oppose and promote zero waste principles. Kirsty, would you talk about your work to address pollution and waste, where we have seen successes, and what we need to do differently. And if you could expand on the problem of plastic pollution specifically and why action is needed. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, as you just heard, a lot is happening in state government around these issues. So we're making some progress. And about five years ago, when I started, you know, four years ago, when I started the Zero Waste Project, we did not hear about plastic. And that has changed. People understand now that it's a problem. And it is a very, very serious problem, but a problem that we have solutions for. Um, one of the problems that the Presidential Action Plan actually addresses is the subsidies for oil and gas. Plastic is made primarily from oil and gas. Think of it as flat, fracked plastic. That's what Bill McKibben is calling it. And so what that means is if we are paying these companies to pump gas out of the earth, we're never going to be able to create fair market conditions where we use reusables or glass and aluminum materials that are actually recyclable. Um, so we need to stop that. We think it's about $650 billion a year of subsidies that the US government is giving to these companies. So again, we need to stop doing that. Um, and remember that the production of plastic is polluting at every stage. Fracking gas, as I said, very polluting, tremendous impact on the climate, the emissions into the environment from methane and other things, very, very polluting, leaving lagoons of polluted water behind. Um, refining and manufacturing the gas and then making it into plastic is incredibly polluting. And we're finding that those facilities as is already stated, are in environmental justice communities, meaning communities where people have less money, uh, less English access, and less um, and more people who are people of color, uh, people with less power, frankly, and they get they are on the front lines and being impacted by these huge facilities across the country. Um, and then, plastics waste management. There's been a, a whole uh, a whole gaslighting that's happened because the oil and gas companies got together and said, we're going to pretend that plastic is recyclable. We're going to slap a triangle on everything. And we're going to tell people it's fine to use this because it's recyclable. But for almost all plastics, there is no market, partly because virgin plastic production is so cheap because of the subsidies I mentioned, but also because there are so many different kinds of plastic with so many different additives that sorting them cleanly to make it actually a reusable product is not financially sustainable. Mm. Uh, and then when you add to that how dangerous plastics are at every stage, as I said, uh, and also how dangerous plastics are to use. As you stated earlier, we have plastics on the mountaintop and we have plastics in the Mariette Trench. We also have plastic particles coming out of our dryers because our clothes are 60% plastic. So we're breathing that in. We have plastics, we're finding plastic in women's placentas. That means that we're directly impacting you know, human health. And then to you know, step further, there's plastic in plankton and there's plastic in anthills and there's plastic in soil. All of our natural systems rely on their ability to absorb oxygen and, and you know, all of those pieces are being hindered by plastic being in the system. So not only is it not recyclable the way that glass or aluminum is recyclable really can be recycled infinitely 
but also it's dangerous to be using these plastics and then drinking out of these plastic containers and eating out of them. So we need to, and, and we're breathing them, honestly. So we need to do a better job with all those pieces. And I think as you, you'll hear from the other panelists, we need to make good choices ourselves and do the best we can. And we need to encourage local solutions, you know, because those also are, you know, what we have in the United States is this wonderful political laboratory where we try things locally and when they work, we try them at the state level. And when they work at the state level, we try them at the federal level. But the problem is a, an international problem. Mm -hmm. um, there's an incinerator in Maine that's been receiving plastic from Northern Ireland. So we need to, and, and some of it got dumped in, the, in a bay in Maine. So we need to do a better job with all of this, but we really need that action you were talking about up front at the federal level, because we have solutions, as the representative just said, producer responsibility for packaging, good, strong deposit return systems or bottle bills, all of those pieces work really well, um, but we need to put them in place in a much broader and in national and really international level. So I'm so glad we're talking about this today because we can solve the problems, but we need to really hunker down and do so. Oh, thank you so much. And I, I think people are surprised when they find out there is no national bottle bill. And uh, we so appreciate the work being done locally across the Commonwealth and hope to put that uh, into use uh, in federal policy. But now I'd like to introduce Nancy Downs. Nancy came on board in August of 2017 and is the lead campaign organizer for Oceana. I always wanna add some syllables to Oceana in the <laughs> Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Prior to joining Oceana, Nancy was on the front lines of protecting the Southern California coastline as both a volunteer and a grassroots activist. And for 12 years as the Southern California's regional manager for Surfrider Foundation, she led numerous campaigns and edu educational programs on marine protected areas, wetland restoration, beach renourishment projects, urban runoff, and marine litter reduction. Nancy, one of the priorities for your organization has been the problem of plastic pollution. And you have extensive experience working to protect our shores and coastal waters. Can you elaborate on the problems of plastics pollution and why action is needed urgently? And thank you again for being with us. Thank you, Congresswoman Clark and Representative Robinson and all the panelists here. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much, especially for your leadership in introducing the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act uh, and just your leadership here locally in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, our oceans are facing a, a massive threat with plastic pollution, and that's, it's either Oceana or Oceana, either one's okay. 17.6 um, billion of plastic pollution enter our oceans every year. That's approximately a garbage truck every minute. Uh, and as uh, Kirsty said, a meager 9%, 8 or 9% of all plastic that's ever been made was actually recycled. So as you said, we cannot recycle our way out of this mess. You know, when you go back 25 years ago, my very first beach cleanup was around 1995 and we innocently brought down tons of trash bags and water bottles for our volunteers and disposable rubber gloves. And we thought we were making a difference. And at the end of the cleanup, we had generated more trash than what was actually on the beach. Hmm. So we knew very quickly that we needed to shift our thinking. And initially we thought these small actions at the local level were gonna have this huge impact, only realizing this plastic is still coming up every week, more and more trash. So we worked on local policies to ban one item and it still wasn't enough. And we started realizing this is a crisis. And over 20 years, we've realized this is not just a local issue, it is a global issue. And the cost is too high for the marine environment. The studies that Oceana has done has shown the impact for marine mammals, not only ingesting this plastic, but also getting entangled in this plastic. It's causing impacts to how they feed, how they mate, and uh, ultimately leads to death in thousands of different species in the marine environment. Um, and it's too high to our coastal economy. As New Englanders, we love our seafood. We love going to the beach. We wait all winter to get down to the coast in Cape Cod in the summertime. And that impacts getting to the beach, 
you know, and a lot of times people don't think about the impact also to our city's infrastructure. You know, when there's plastic waste in the communities, it's getting into our rivers and waterways. It causes flooding. It impacts the trash trucks. The bags get stuck in those trucks. The taxpayers have to pay the money in dealing with this waste cleanup. We really need to start shifting the responsibility back onto the plastic manufacturers. And we have an opportunity to demand companies provide us with plastic free alternatives. So like we shouldn't be the ones stuck at the grocery store trying to make that choice. These companies should be providing better choices for us as consumers. So urging consumers to shift our purchasing power back to the companies and make them provide us with better choices. You know, when you're shopping online, you don't have a choice. You have to do the plastic peanuts or the plastic packaging. We should demand choices when we have things shipped to us. And ultimately government too plays a huge role, um, both at the local, state and federal level. So Oceana works with local communities in Massachusetts. The, the one that, I, that currently comes to mind is the town of Attleboro, I think has nine different items that they're trying to eliminate from their community. It's very impressive. So it's not just bags, they're looking at straws, expanded polystyrene foam takeout containers, the intentional release of balloons, and even the plastic alcohol nip bottles. Um, so they're looking to comprehensively reduce those items from their community. And by that leadership, that can influence the state, which then influences these, these comprehensive bills like the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. So definitely urging people that are listening to understand, even if you don't live on the coast, this plastic pollution has a huge impact on you, your health, and your water quality, your air quality, uh, and the marine environment. And so doing your part to reduce your purchasing of these plastic items, but then urging your city, state and federal elected officials to pass these bills is gonna make a huge difference. And happy to answer any other questions you have. It's just great to be here. Oh, thank you so much, Nancy. And thank you for really connecting yeah. how this all comes together wherever you live in the country. This is an issue that impacts the quality of your health and life. Next, I'd like to introduce Dwayne Tyndall. Dwayne serves as the Executive Director of Alternatives for Community and Environment, a neighborhood-based environmental justice and transit-oriented development nonprofit. ACE works to organize residents and work with community organizers locally, statewide, and nationally to build platforms and offer resources that address systemic injustice. ACE is the first environmental justice nonprofit organization in Massachusetts and has defended the rights of Roxbury residents for over 25 years. Dwayne, we are so happy and grateful that you joined us today. We'd love to hear more about your work and why it is so important that we center environmental justice frontline communities in the fight against plastics, pollution, and climate change. Thank you, Dwayne. First, because environmental justice communities are the canary in the coal mines. We feel it first, we feel it the hardest, we feel it during this pandemic, the air quality that impacts, <laughs> um, that cause asthma, and then you relate it to COVID and the, the vast impact that it have on our communities. Um, and then we realize that we only live on one planet, one community, and how we are so interrelated. Um, the plastic pollution is not affecting all population equally. Poor working class, black, brown, ethnic communities are carrying that weight. The production of plastic pollutes the air, water, and soil along every step of its production. We know this, and then again, when it's discarded in landfills or burnt in the incinerators, while we all suffer the impacts to some extent, it's poor communities, it's frontline communities that really are seeing the greatest impacts. As fossil fuel companies see the writing on the wall for their oil and gas, they are looking to the growth in the plastic industry to keep their profits flowing. All companies are very, very intelligent and profit driven. You cut one avenue off, they create two additionals. And that will mean more poisoning of the air, water, and land of marginalized people in our country and around the world. Meaning the neighborhood near you, 
your urban centers, traditional red line communities, um, communities that have been historically discriminated against. For Soma Plastic is constructing a new facility in Louisiana, St. James Parish, where 87% of the residents of the fifth district are black. The construction not only threatened the health of residents, but it would also desecrate the burial site of enslaved African Americans. Mm. We stand in solidarity with, with um, our people in St. James Paris. A 2016 study found compelling evidence that the Houston area communities with high populations of color and high poverty levels face high risk from chemical accidents and everyday toxic exposure. We stand in solidarity with those communities. And right here in Massachusetts, the real invader incinerated in Saugus is taking other community trash, over 400,000 tons of trash, burning it, burying 100,000 tons of ash in an unlined landfill, thereby poisoning the water and the air of the EJ communities of Saugus, Revere, and Lynn. Chemicals and plastic corporations can only get away with selling their noxious product if they have low income and powerless people to build their plant or incinerators next to. That's why when we protect all our people, we truly protect all our people. Without anyone to dump on, we are better off. And this is an opportunity to have a reset, to have a real discussion how we protect all our communities. This pandemic shows that our state lines, our town lines, our city lines are illusionary at best. And now is the time that we can actually make a difference. So thank you for hearing us out. And I'll thank you for having me here. Thank you so much, Dwayne. And your canary in the coal mine line really resonates with me as we look at just the effects from this pandemic and how, how similar um, it is to environmental justice. It has no respect for uh, partisan lines or, or town lines and municipality lines, state lines. And we are only as healthy as um, our, our most vulnerable communities. So thank you for being with us and, and for your work on this important component of environmental justice. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Emily Norton. Emily joined the Charles River Watershed Association as executive director in August of 2018. She previously served as Massachusetts chapter director for the Sierra Club, where she advocated for stronger renewable energy policies at the state and local level. And prior to that, she spent 10 years as a research and communications consultant to groups such as the Conservation Law Foundation, Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships, Environmental Defense Fund, and the US EPA Energy Star Program. Emily serves as an elected city councilor in her hometown of Newton, where she is a member of the Finance Committee and the Public Safety and Transportation Committee. Some of her local victories include a citywide ban on plastic bags, restriction on the use of polluting leaf blowers, and changing the name of the outdated term alderman to city councilor. In her city council role, Emily serves on the Massachusetts Municipal Association Environmental Policy Committee. Emily, it's great to have you here. And I am hoping that you be able to discuss what it's like to deal with this issue on a local level. And we know you bring state expertise as well and why it's so important for our watersheds that we deal with it now. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Representative Clark, for this important discussion and for your leadership with your legislation to take an ambitious approach to, uh, to dealing with this crisis and plastic pollution. It is uh, extremely tough to be the last speaker after all of these amazing individuals and leaders, so I'll just be brief and piling on to the points uh, that my fellow pa uh, panelists have made. At CRWA, we organize the biggest um, river cleanup in the country each year. Uh, the Earth Day Charles River Cleanup in partnership with our partners at the Esplanade Association, Charles River Conservancy, the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, and others. And in fact, the major way that plastic pollution gets to the oceans is through rivers flowing mm -hmm. through heavily populated areas. 
And at our cleanup, we have thousands, literally thousands of volunteers, not in a pandemic, but before this, and we will do, be doing it again, um, picking up over 40 tons of trash. And that's great. But what about the rest of the year? And why should residents have to be doing that anyway? It makes us wonder, like, why is our government not stepping up to prevent companies from making and discarding products that are killing us? From as, as Kirsty laid out and as Dwayne laid out, from the petroleum that is a key ingredient to plastic to when it breaks down into microplastics, which ends up in our food chain and our placentas, um, we get cancer, we get autoimmune diseases and more. And then the air and water pollution at the end, the end of the life cycle for plastic when it's landfilled or incinerated from soup to nuts, basically, to paraphrase Belle Biv DeVoe, this stuff is poison. In addition to my day job, as you heard, I also serve as a city councilor. And there, as I, as um, the representative mentioned, I um, led on uh, the plastic bag ban, also polystyrene ban. Um, <laughs> and I can tell you, we see way fewer plastic bags now. It is beautiful. I just had a resident tell me the Bullows Pond Association that was always yanking bags out of our local pond. They don't have to do that anymore. So it definitely works. Over 100 communities in Massachusetts have banned plastic bags. Dozens have banned polystyrene. Many have banned even straws, plastic bottles. Attleboro has really gone above and beyond. But it means there's different rules in different communities, which is hard on our retailers, confusing for our residents. Local communities can only do so much. So in the words of Benjamin Franklin, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We need our state government and our federal government to be a partner in protecting our residents, protecting public health, and eliminating products that are killing us. It has been a long four years, um, but we are so happy to have a partner again in our federal government. Obviously, you, Representative Clark, have always been our partner, but now we are at least in a position to make real progress on this urgent issue. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Emily, and thank all of you. Uh, we are so lucky to have each and every one of you helping us address this problem. So let's start with where Emily left off. We have a new administration, uh, one that understands the complexity. I think I just went off. We can hear you still. Yeah, we can yep, still. I still see you. Okay. All right. Great. Um, uh, the complexity of the situation in front of us, and how? What is the most urgent action we can take to reverse this damage? I definitely think passing the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act would be a huge step in the right direction. Absolutely. So each person individually speaking to their member of Congress, no matter where you are in the United States and urging your elected official to co-sponsor this piece of legislation would be amazing. I think that's right. And also helping to marshal uh, the data in terms of the costs. So there's the environmental um, discussion, but I can tell you in Newton, we're paying almost as much now to get rid of recyclables as we are to get rid of trash. We, we have to pay to pick up, you know, our bottle bill is very limited. Um, we need, it's far beyond needing to be expanded. And so we pay to pick up the trash in our parks and, and roadways. So that is a cost, sort of an invisible cost that every taxpayer is paying. So corporations are making the profits and Joe Q Public is paying. So I think that would help build support for that bill as well, as long, you know, people really understood, you're already paying for this. This is not an extra cost. I would totally agree with the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Call your federal legislators, call your Congress people right now. Um, also, Emily is 100% correct. We've been doing a survey of municipalities across Massachusetts. Cities and towns are paying sometimes 10 times as much for their recycling because the recycling system is not working. You can't mix everything together and then expect you're going to be able to separate it out and have a marketable commodities that actually have value. We need to keep things separate through a bottle bill, through producer responsibility for packaging systems and move forward that way. The other thing I would say is don't be, um, don't be fooled by false solutions. Mm. Building on what Dwayne said earlier, that wheel of braid or Saugus incinerator was pitched as in 1974 as new technology that was gonna solve the trash problem. And we're seeing gasification, pyrolysis, uh, and other types of incineration, other types of high heat tech 
to do this for sewage sludge in Taunton, to revamp the, the Wheel of Raider Saugus facility. Um, these ex all high heat needs to go. Bill McKibben just wrote an article about that in the Times recently. If it's high heat, it's bad for the climate. It's expensive. It doesn't create many jobs. It destroys resources and it creates a lot of pollution, period. There is no high heat technology, whether it's, as I said, gasification paralysis or chemical recycling that doesn't create a ton of pollution. So, and they, and they end up in frontline EJ communities over and over again. There is no away, remember that, and we have to deal with these materials up front and upstream, not think that we're gonna send them off to be burned or buried somewhere safely because that's a fallacy, it's never gonna happen. Yeah, that is, is such an incredible point that there really is no out of sight, out of mind, that this continues to exist and be a problem for all of us. And uh, Dwayne, that brings me uh, to a question specifically for you. We see so much of this pollution, um, uh, you know, bad environmental effects in our most vulnerable communities and frequently communities of color. How do we involve, how do we engage with those communities? How can we do a better job of finding those real solutions, working with our frontline communities? I think it's a combination of education outreach with enforcing regulations and laws. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think um, without like, like harder and harder regulations and in a stronger legal framework will really push it anyway. We know the legacy of poor air quality. We call it asthma. And all throughout the country, in many of our communities, we have very, very high asthma rates. So we know intimately. The fight is on a policy and legislative level of can we win the argument that regulations and enforcing laws that more than many times are on the books already to kind of really make it create a change. But I think it's a combination of organizing education with the legal. We see it as a civil right. Uh, environmental justice is racial justice. That's right. So like we have a long tradition of organizing and bringing in our legal, legal and regulatory framework to create change. It's, it's not as hot, but it works. And, and those, two, two, those two things of organizing and in the legal framework, help advance the agenda bits and pieces of the time. So thank you. That's great. And we know that this transformation is going to take time. And there are so many competing priorities, but Maria, maybe you can start us off. What would you like to see as a top priority in tackling this crisis? Sure. I think for us, starting with a plastic bag ban is so important because it impacts the rest of the entire process. You can't have clean recycling when people are still putting plastic bags in with their recycling and it gums up the machines and it creates larger issues down the road. And so that's, that's something that feels very straightforward. Um, and again, I think it's at the same time, I'm, I'm torn between that and really pushing on the extended producer responsibility because I think it's so important for us um, to hold those companies to account. And at the same time, thinking right now in a post-pandemic world that we want our small businesses to succeed and we, would, we don't want to add any additional costs. We recognize how hard it is living on the margins for a lot of our amazing restaurants who do use polystyrene because it is inexpensive. How can we ensure that from a government perspective that we're um, equalizing the table and ensuring that compostable and, and reusable materials cost the same as polystyrene? Um, and, and so that's our responsibility to ensure that we're helping all along um, the entire life cycle of these products. Yeah, thank you. Kirsty, what's some priorities you'd like to see? 
Well, I think that we need to stop nibbling around the edges and go to the heart of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, as the representative just said, producer responsibility, that's making the, the companies that are benefiting from this plastic crisis, that's making them accountable. That would, the, the bill in Massachusetts, which we spent a lot of time on, um, would actually reimburse cities and towns for their recycling costs for packaging and paper. So we're talking about probably 40% of the waste for the, you know, the recycling piece for that city and town would then be paid for and it would encourage those corporations to redesign. That's the real key, redesign their products so that they reduce and that they're more recyclable or reusable. And that, that's the crux of it right there, making them um, accountable. The same with the bottle bill, though the producer resp responsibility for packaging piece, which also exists in the Break Free from Plastic Act, would be huge. Um, and then again, we need to take those big bites and be honest about what works and what doesn't. Plastic bags are not recyclable, but no filmy plastic is recyclable, meaning that there's no market for filmy plastic at all. There's only a market for number one, number two, and sometimes number five plastics, those containers. So we really need to ban any of the plastics that there's not a market for and phase out single use plastics as much as possible, as soon as possible. Um, so the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act would do a lot of that, but also uh, as we referenced before, the um, presidential plan would be really impactful because it would stop the investment in those, uh, in those false technologies, those false solutions like chemical recycling, gasification process, incineration, and also stop subsidizing, really stop subsidizing um, oil and gas industry. And that's really, all of that is really key. So again, as I think Nancy said a couple times too, call your legislator, you know, and remember that you wanna go by the zero waste hier hierarchy, reduce, reuse, and recycle and compost. But remember first reduce and reuse and no high heat and avoid plastic whenever you can. That's plastic's never the answer. Yeah. Emily, what would you cite as a priority? Uh, well, as usual, my fellow panelists have already, you know, <laughs> already hit everything, but absolutely the bags are so key because they're one of the easier things. You can bring your own bag. You can pay 10 cents in Newton for a paper bag. So, you know, let's let's hit the lowest hanging fruit first. And a lot of people see the bags as trash, they see them around. Um, I honestly think a key reason that the bag ban passed in uh, in Boston was when at that time, Councillor Ayanna Presley said, this is an incredibly important issue for communities of color and low income communities. We don't like trash in our neighborhoods either. So that seems like one that should be easier to tackle, but absolutely getting the costs right. We should not be subsidizing fossil fuels in any form for many reasons. And we should not be subsidizing chemical factories. We should not be subsidizing plastic in any way. We should be incentivizing um, the compostable, the reusable. Because even if you're a consumer that wants to go into the store and avoid plastic, it's virtually impossible. Like I literally buy shampoo and conditioner, which obviously is looking great, in a box. And it's just like a bar of shampoo and conditioner. Like that's cool, but I have to order it online. Like I can't even get it at my local store. So then like some Amazon guy brings, so it's just, it's just all wrong. So we need to make it easier for people by getting the cost right. And this legislation and the, the presidential approach um, that you're proposing uh, would help us get there. Yeah. I, I think that's absolutely right. I've really been struck by all of your comments of let's let's flip this paradigm so it is not consumers going in trying to make do, um, but it is more corporations uh, changing their business models to help us get there. And Actually, can I pile on with one more thing there? Sure. There's, there's this argument sometimes among the environmental community on whether it's corporations have all the responsibility, individuals have all the responsibility. Obviously corporations need to be doing much more, but I do think uh, individuals can do a lot. When corporations see individuals taking steps to reduce plastic, tweeting at them to reduce plastic, when, when people see us, and we've seen this in, in other arenas, including um, the racial justice conversations that we're having, that corporations have been leading more than our president over the last four years. So I do think, I, I don't wanna leave individuals like, oh, I just gotta wait until the, the, the politicians and the corporations do it all. No, we even as individuals do have a lot of power. Those local bans have made the statewide bans possible. That's the, there are a dozen communities that have banned plastic water bottles in Massachusetts. 
And now Nestle is coming to the table on the bottle bill because they're afraid that their product is going to get banned across the board. Yeah. What you do locally is fantastic. Don't stop. Just because we need a federal solution doesn't mean the local part isn't really crucial. Emily's 100% correct. That's right. And I think, oh, go ahead. Uh, the, I think that's right. Uh, the I because my fellow panelists have done this federal government down, you know, this top down. Really, we can't wait. That it's urgent, and this bill should be passed. But I'll flip that. And you're right, Emily, that the more we do this, 139 towns in the state of Massachusetts have already banned the the plastic bag. So we're already like leaning towards the. You know, you got to be kidding. So many of us have already done it. It makes it easier to convince the state to go ahead. Like so many have already taken that. Um, initiative. And I'm agreeing with Dwayne, education, education, education. Um, even in the town of Attleboro, there's excitement that one of the um, companies are now producing uh, like a bioplastic for the nip bottles. And they think that's great. Isn't that great? And the answer is no, because those nip bottles that are bioplastic, it requires industrial composting. So if someone throws out a plastic nip bottle on the street or a bioplastic nip bottle on the street, they're both gonna sit there because that bioplastic bottle needs industrial composting. So people don't realize the likelihood of that product actually getting to the industrial composting facility is not gonna happen. And even a bio bag, if it ends up in the ocean, it doesn't have the heat pressure and bacteria that would be needed for that bio bag to actually break down. So it's about educating people that these transitioning from one single use disposable item to another disposable item is not the solution. It's about not wasting our resources and reusing these, these valuable resources that we have. So education, education, and local level is, is critical. And that gives everyone who's on this call who's a constituent of Representative Clark something else to do because we know that calling your Congresswoman might not uh, change her mind because she's already there, but it, you can reach out to your city councilor or town meeting member and your state representatives and state senators, we certainly have lots of work to be done. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, um, you know, as I look at this and so much of it, I hear so frequently from constituents, but I recycle, you know, I'm doing my part and, and we, you know, we encourage that. We don't want to discourage that. Like you said, these individual actions do matter. But maybe um, you can talk about sort of the state of recycling and, and where we need to go. I was pretty alarmed at the statistic about the very low percentage that of plastics we actually recycle. And Nancy, you hit on some of the problem is it takes an industrial um, recycling uh, to, to get us there. So how do we begin to, to look at that? So I was just gonna say, yeah, I started my career in Burlington, Vermont as the recycling coordinator when recycling became mandatory. And it was, I think, exciting for people to have something that they could do. It was sort of like, whoa, wait a minute, what? You want me to go through my trash? Like it was a big behavior change. And now, as you said, everyone's like, oh, but I recycle, I recycle. Unfortunately, it turned out to be not all that. And now, um, now we need to get beyond that um, because recycled means so many of these are not even recyclable. They're certainly not recyclable the way glass is over and over or paper. So, and I, I know Kirsty and, and Nancy and the others can speak in more detail about the state of the industry, but I did want to, since we have this opportunity, some folks may have seen the Boston Globe article about Jack Coughlin from Agawam, who is a local hero who would just walk the streets picking up nip bottles and he was hit by a car he's in his 70s he was hit oh by a car God. and he's now been paralyzed and yeah. you know is this the, the fault of the nip bottle industry maybe not you know he, he he was hit by a car it was it was nighttime but if he didn't if we didn't have these nip bottles out there in the street people like him wouldn't have to be a lot walking along the streets picking them up so i just did want to give him a shout out because it's just such a horrible thing that happened to him and here it is he's a he's a community hero in agawam and um and I, I would hope that our state legislature and the federal government would take action on this issue, if even out of to, to honor to honor his work. Yeah, I was at the hearing where Mr. Coughlin um, testified uh, in Massachusetts, and you know we did not manage to ban nips or add them to the bottle bill or expand the bottle bill. Um, we know how to solve this problem. We literally do. 
And the way to solve this problem is to kind of set up a system of collection like we have for the bottle bill right now, but include all beverage containers and to set up systems like producer responsibility for packaging where the city governments are paid for the work they do. So we have enough staff. That's another EJ part of this. You know, communities like Newton have wonderful staff for recycling, not as many as they probably need, but they have great, you know, great staff. Communities like Lowell and Lawrence are always struggling to even have the money to pay the staff and to have the staff. So they're working their tails off and they can't create the systems we need. So producers need to pay for that. We need to expect them to pay for that. And we have to be realistic, as Nancy was saying, about these false solutions. Plastic is not going to be recycled well, efficiently, or cleanly ever. Um, we need to move towards reusables, refillables, like we had when we were kids in the 70s. All the Coke and Pepsi bottles were refilled. That has much less of a climate impact, much, much less of a climate impact. Reusing a bottle 50 times, you just have to wash it and move it around, that's it. Making a new bottle, whether it's out of plastic or glass, takes a tremendous, much, much, much more energy, many, many, many more resources. Um, and we have to be honest about what works and what doesn't and not buy into the corporation saying that they're gonna solve this problem for us. Coke and Pepsi and the American Beverage Association have been saying they're gonna solve this problem for 30 years. They're gonna use recycled plastic. They're gonna do, they've never done any of it. And even the proposals that they're making now would only take care of 1% of the problem. So we need to take the solutions we know work and put them in place. Um, and again, we've got great bills coming up through the Zero Waste Caucus, as the representative said earlier, that Rep Day and Rep Sacola and Senator Lewis are, are proposing for producer responsibility for packaging, for a single use um, omnibus bill, and for an expanded bottle bill. We can do all those things in Massachusetts. You certainly, we certainly can do this in the federal government too through the existing bills that you're proposing. So we can make this happen. We just need to do it, honestly. Yeah, Nancy. Actually, real quick, um, you may be able to answer my question this, but I know that over the years we sent all of our waste away, right? It went to other countries and those countries have now um, realized the impact to their own communities, to their own health and just they have reached capacity and said, no, thank you, and have started shipping our waste back. So again, to the taxpayers, this realization that we are now going to be faced with that bill of dealing, which it's actually funny, the irony, we now have to deal with our own trash. So that's a good thing because now we can be realistic about how much we're actually generating and how much it costs. But I think a lot of people uh, locally may not realize that once was in a way thing um, and now it is something that we have to deal with head on here in the state of Massachusetts and the United States. Yeah, that's that's correct. What what happened is that the waste industry bought the recycling companies. They vertically vert, vertically integrated, and so then they said we're going to go to single stream, no sort recycling. And about ten years ago, waste management, Casella, Wheelabrator, Cavanta, all did that. And what they told communities and their articles all over places put whatever you want in that recycling, put a laundry basket in there, put some Christmas tree lights, and we're gonna recycle all of it. And it, as Nancy said, it got shipped to China where China was building their recycling markets and their recycling infrastructure. And now that China has done that, they don't need our badly um, sorted plastics and paper. So they have, will not take our mixed paper and plastic because they have little to no value. Um, and then the waste companies, instead of saying, oh, this no sort thing was a bad idea, or we're gonna start deep sorting, or we're gonna support a bottle bill, or we're gonna go to back to dual stream or any of the things that do work, they said, oh, we're gonna charge all the cities and towns because you're doing a terrible job with your sorting. So that's why Newton's getting this bill. That's why all the Western mass communities are getting these bills. We're seeing this across the country. Um, as Nancy said, the, the taxpayers, the consumers are being left holding the bill on this. And it's really, not fair. Um, and it just underscores that there was never in a way, I don't think a lot of stuff was getting recycled in China either, but we didn't have to deal with it right up front. And now we do. So this is the time to pass state and federal le legislation that will change this whole, this whole system. And it, again, without the local folks pushing for it, it's not going to happen. So thank gosh, we have, you know, all these people who are stepping up on this and, and paying close attention. Oh, that's, it is both harrowing and inspiring. <laughs> so how do you think as um, a, a, you know, federal representative with these solutions that are coming out of our local communities, um, 
How do you think we can be better responsive? I mean, we've talked about education, but how can we better connect with these locally based solutions that are arising? And Dwayne, I'll, I'll start with you for your thoughts. I think we need to need it connected to um, public health outcomes. Yeah. We got to make it, we got to put it on the front door of everyone. It's not a particular community, even though particular communities may be impacted more. It's something we all in the same boat, whether you drill a hole at one end or the other end, um, if we're not careful, we will all be impacted. So public health is something that kind of only get noticed during like times like this. So I think it would be good if we take advantage of these times and connect air quality and public health and plastics and, and, and basically create that alchemy and say, this is what we need to do. We need to improve our air quality to improve our public health. And I think that may be one of the ways that we can start moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, it seems like public health prevention are always things that are first to cut, last to be restored. And maybe the, the, the lasting lesson of this pandemic is going to be reversing that order. Anyone else want to address that? Maria, Emily? I think, sure. So I would love to see our burgeoning climate change movement, um, especially the youth climate change movement, really tie plastics and zero waste into what they're looking at. Um, I view plastics as this really intersectional issue where it, it ties in municipal, federal, state government, it ties in climate change, it ties in environmental justice. It, it has elements associated with all of that, but not all of those individual pieces necessarily see themselves as part of the zero waste and ending the single use plastic movement. Um, and, and helping to join those communities is something that I'm pretty passionate about to make sure that people under, better understand that all of these individual decisions will impact this larger goal that they have of stopping climate change. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I was gonna say that in Newton, we do have some people who are conservative, politically conservative, and it's been sort of surprising to me. I've taken some steps that they haven't really liked because I'm pretty lefty, but there is a relatively um, less consternation on when I, when I tackle plastics. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just a Newton Republican thing, but I do. it does give me some hope that this is an issue that protecting our environment, um, saving money, um, not having corporate giveaways, that, that that is something that could get support across the political aisle. I know that that is something that you obviously have to deal with in Congress as officials do at every level is, is working um, with their compatriots in, um, in the other party. And so that is something that, um, that does sort of give me hope for this issue is if we are brave enough, and that's what's been frustrating at the state level. Um, as Kirsty knows, we've been battling um, to try to get this plastic bag ban uh, done statewide. And it's like, all right, then we'll just do 10 more local bans and 10 more local bans. Like legislature, are you going to ban this once we have, I don't know, all 351 cities and towns have done it on their own. Um, especially when you have the Shrewsbury and the more, the more conservative towns doing it. Um, so that's, that's something that does give me hope for this issue that, you know, no one likes to see plastic trash. And, you know, if the case is made, um, if people did have a better understanding of it's not just, you know, what you see in the trash, it's not just the pla microplastics that we are ingesting, it's how this stuff is produced and, and who ends up across the world, as Dwayne said, um, suffering the most from this when we're protecting, when, when it can't be dumped anywhere, we're, then we got to come up with a new solution, right? So that's, that does give me a bit of hope. I think this can be a, bar, a bipartisan issue and maybe that's me being naive and only being at the local and state level, not at the federal level, but um, you know, hope springs eternal there. Well, you anticipated my uh, final question, um, which is with so much <clears throat> challenge to our public health, uh, sort of, it can be overwhelming. You think you've been doing the right things, sorting things in your blue boxes, um, and you find out that that really isn't being recycled. And in fact, that local municipalities are being charged back for a lack of recycling. So we have a new administration that's focused on climate change, 
focused on this issue of plastics. Um, what gives you hope? And how can we continue to have people focus on this and working towards it uh, without getting sort of overwhelmed with everything else going on in this pandemic? And we'll start with Nancy. How do you, how do yeah, you find I am inspiration? I am eager to answer this because entire countries have banned these single use items. States have banned these single use items. Our local communities have banned these single use items. There are restaurants throughout Massachusetts that have leadership. I'm thinking about, about a place in Harwich that I love to go to that has smoothie bowls. They've switched completely, have no plastic whatsoever. Um, so it, it can be done, it is being done and there's enough businesses, states and governments around the country and the globe that have already successfully done this that we need to just highlight the success and show that it the cost is more expensive to not do it and that it can already be done. So that gives me hope. That's great. Kirsty? Two things give me hope actually, and I am a very hopeful person or I couldn't do this work. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, two things give me hope. One is the point that Emily made because the communities that have banned plastic water bottles are on the Cape and the Cape is not a lefty uh, Bastion, you know, the Cape is a relatively conservative place, but they care about the ocean and they care about their homes. And that's something we all have in common. So I agree with Emily that this is not a left or a right issue. This is something that if you want to live in a clean community, you, you want to ban these unrecyclable single use plastics and single use goods in general. The other part that gives me a tremendous amount of hope is not only seeing all the examples that Nancy's referring to, and I would, I would point you all to Zero Waste Europe for all kinds of case studies for places that this has worked. Um, in the Philippines too, they've done some fantastic work. Um, not only do we have these good examples, but also uh, as a report just came out from Gaia, the Global Anti-Incineration Association, Gaia found that these solutions, zero waste solutions create jobs. If we are refilling and reusing our containers, if we are composting cleanly and putting the soil back onto the earth, if we are reducing and reusing and then recycling and composting as much as we can and redesigning to make it all better, there are many, many more jobs, green jobs, clean, safe jobs in that than there are in back up a truck and dump it and burn it or bury it. So we really, the, the only, the only uh, folks who stand to lose money are the big plastic companies and the big oil and gas companies. Cities and towns will save money, there'll be more local businesses, and there'll be more green jobs. So if we're all going to save money, if we're, you know, consumers and cities and towns are going to save money, and the governments are going to save money, it's just on oil and gas and, and uh, the chemical and plastic industry, it's going to lose money. I'm fine with that. I think that sounds fantastic. So this is a great idea for all of us. We'll all come out ahead if we implement those zero waste solutions that the representative was talking about. So that gives me great hope. I love being right and being the fiscally responsible choice. It's a fantastic place to be. That's a good spot to land in. Yeah. Dwayne, where, where are you pulling optimism from frontline communities that have been so disproportionately hit by this pandemic and just have a history of environmental injustice? Where do you see those glimmers of hope? I'm seeing it on the municipal level. Um, I'm a town meeting member in the town of Brookline and I remember when we banned plastic bags a few years ago two nights of debate, but we banned. <laughs> <laughs> but we banned. <laughs> but two we, nights would be a record in Congress. Yeah, that's, oh, shoot, <laughs> that's the average for Brookline. But it's the more people know, the more people are begin to shift. And I really believe that the blue, the blue, um, you know, the recycling cult that we had basically we moved it from our conscious mind. And as we put it more into our conscious mind, into public discourse, we will make a logical self-interest decision to move away from these products. But this is just a process of bringing it back into public discourse on a policy level, on a neighborhood level, to have a different type of conversation. 
and try to avoid the false solutions that have been propagated by multiple different entities. So it's, it's small steps, but we are moving in the right direction. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Maria, we'll, we'll end with you. Sure. Uh, on a note of optimism, I'd say, you know, the United States has done this. We were the first country to ban plastic microbeads. Um, and, and I think when we're still one of less than a dozen countries that has done that, we're capable of doing this kind of work. And I'm so excited to see the kind of effort that's happening at all of these different levels of government and bringing together um, these unusual bedfellows to have this conversation about the our future public health. I, I think it's incredibly heartening and I'm so thrilled that you brought this group together today to have this conversation. And I hope it kicks off a larger effort where we're all making the same push at the state, local and uh, federal level. So thank you so much, Congressman. Well, thank all of you. And Emily, did you wanna add something? No, I was just gonna unmute to say thank you before we close up. <laughs> well, I just want to thank all of you, not only for joining us here, but giving all of us optimism and hope through your work and your concentration on this and helping us really see how interconnected we are and that we also have the tools to change and uh, to address plastics, pollution, environmental justice, um, these issues that can seem like they are just beyond our grasp, but they really aren't. And uh, we're so grateful and I am inspired by the work that all of you do and hope that this pandemic for all the suffering and loss that it has caused will underline how interconnected and interdependent we all are. And the key priority that funding public health and addressing these issues should play in our policy and in our lives. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your work. And we look forward to working together uh, to make our planet uh, more just and healthier and cleaner.